personal learning lectures. Uh, the lecture I'm going to discuss today is from chapter 2 of your textbook. And it's more an introduction of um, simple, uh, simple notations and, and simple models that are going to be used throughout the textbook. Um, as I say, it's an introdu introductory session. Um, I'm going to familiarize you with some of the notations here and the notion of test and training data. And lastly, I'm going to speak with um, bias variance trade-off and, uh, and of course, test and training set and flex how flexibility can affect that. So, um, the lectures that I'm going to use today is available on iLearn, so please download them at your convenience. It's more, uh, it's really appreciative you can print it as well. It will really help you um, to go through the lecture notes with that. Okay, so I motivate the talk today with the simplest, one of the simplest models possible. Assume you want to predict sales in a specific um, region with three variables. Um, with TV ads, the amount of money you spend on TV, on radio, and newspaper. So on Y variable, we have sales on, on each scales here. And on X variable, we have TV sales, radio, and newspapers uh, ads. For example, uh, we can focus on $200,000 spec expenditure on TV ads and see how much, um, how much sale we can expect. So for, for that, we have a couple of observations for, uh, for 200, when you spend $200 on, uh, on ads, we have different observations. For example, here, uh, we had uh, 10,000 sales, here we had uh, 11,000 sales, and here we had an observation at the same $200 expenditure that uh, resulted in 23,000 uh, sales. The same thing happens in radio and newspaper. So the simplest model we may have is a model that predicts sales that, that is approximate. This is an approximation um, notation. Approximately the function on the expenditure you spend on TVs, radios, and newspapers. So one of the questions you should always ask yourself when you're running any data analysis is just draw a scatter plot of your data and see what they uh, suggest. For example, just by this simple uh, scatter plot, one, one thing we can say is that if we fit just a linear model on each of these variable uh, uh, on, uh, to predict sales only based on one variable, uh, these are the results we get. For example, this is the um, simple linear regression line that is described that describes the relation between TV and sales. This is a simple regression line that only describes radio expenditure and sales and so on and so forth. So one of the questions you can always ask yourself by looking at this data is that, is there any relationship there? Um, so I want you to pause it and think if you see, an, uh, um, see a relationship. I'm sure your answer will be yes because we have a positive slope curve here that suggests that the more we spend on TV, the more sales we expect. The more we spend on radio, the more sales we expect, and the more we spend in newspaper, the more sales we expect. We should be very prudent to um, convey causality. Maybe the some of these variables does not suggest causality, meaning that maybe, even though this positive relationship exists, maybe it doesn't mean TV ads increase sales. Maybe that in the regions that you spend a lot on TV, You've also spent a lot on newspaper, and the positive correlation you see here is reflected by the fact that you spend money on TV as well. So that may not be the causality thing you're looking after. Another thing you can answer just by looking at this very simple graph is um, which one of these variables are, uh, are, are affecting our sales more. Is it TV that affects our sales more, radio or newspaper? The answer to this question is also very simple. You look at the magnitude of slope, and this is slope, of course, is largest. So we, we just say, okay, for TV, the slope is largest, so we expect the TV 
uh, affects sales more than the other two variables, radio and newspaper. So let me uh, explain a couple of notations. Uh, in mathematics, it's always easier to just uh, summarize things in, in the easiest possible fashion. And one thing you can do is to vectorize things. Here we had three variables. Um, we had TV sales, radio, demand, sorry, uh, TV ads, radio ads, and newspaper ads. We also had a response variable which was sales. We wanted to see how much sale we can ex expect. So, um, we can vectorize things. For any amount of sale, we know how much is being spent on TV, radio, and newspaper. So if we put uh, all of these variables in a vector called x, we can define a relation of sa sales with that, uh, a function on that variable plus errors. This epsilon called errors, error term. In previous slide, if you can remember, I said sales is approximated with a function of radio, TV, and etc. Here, um, we just equalize things. Oh, oops. We, we just equalize things, and the way we did it was by adding this epsilon. So we changed um, approximation to equalization just by adding this epsilon term. So this x is actually a vector. I don't know what's going on here. Um, this x is actually a vector and this is a function of this vector. So we simplified our notations instead of saying y is equal to let's say f of x1, x2, and x3. We just define plus epsilon. We just define x as x1, x2, x3. And then we just re, uh, describe this as x. So there is nothing that you need to worry about. It's just uh, saving uh, space and uh, being more consistent with mathematical notations. This x is called the input vector. It has other names as well, it's called features, inputs, or predictors, and sometimes independent variables. I am not too confident, comfortable with calling them independent variables, although they have been used a lot in literature. Y, which in this case was sales, has all different names as well. They're called response variables, target variables, and so on and so forth. I highly suggest you stick to response. Response is the best name you can call it. It is also called dependent variable. So one of the questions you may ask yourself um, is what type of functional form should I consider? What is a good f that I can consider uh, so that I can predict y better? For example, a couple of functional forms that we can consider are as follows. So let me describe them here. For example, here is a functional form that we can consider. We can say, okay, sales is beta 0 plus beta 1 times TV, amount of money you put on TV ads, plus beta 2 times radio, plus beta 3 times um, newspaper, plus epsilon. That's a linear, that's a simple linear function. You can, so this function, the functional form on um, TV, radio, and newspaper is just a simple linear function. You can make it more sophisticated. For example, you can say, okay, sales is equal to uh, exponential of beta 0 plus beta 1 TV plus beta 2 radio plus beta 3 news, plus epsilon. That's another functional form you can consider. You can do a lot of uh, different combination of these functional forms. For, for this case, if we take log, we get logarithm of sales will be equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 TV plus beta 2 radio and beta 3 news. So as you can, so, so, so the difference of these two functions 
these two functional forms, actually these two functional forms, is that uh, if you take a log of sales as your response variable instead of normal sales, you get just a linear function as well. These beta zeros are different from this one because they have to be estimated based on logarithm of sale. You can define many different versions of that. For example, you can define um, you can you can define sales as just beta one times TV times radio times plus um, beta 2 nu. This is another functional form. So there are infinite number of functional forms that we can consider. Each one of them is different. So, so one of the questions we have to answer all the time is what is a good f? What is a good f? How do we define a good f? A good f or a good functional form is the one that predicts y at new point x. That's a good f. A, a good functional form is the one that has some predictability. So if you use some functional forms that doesn't create new uh, predictability, that means they weren't uh, that useful. So a good functional form is the one that has good predictability. And um, throughout the course, not in this lecture, throughout the course you will learn how to define a good f and how to compare different uh, functional forms to decide which one is the best. So, another good, another criterion that defines a good f is the one that is uh, explaining why based on relevant data. For example, um, for example, if you want to just consider income or wage. It can be a function of seniority, let me find seniority, years of um, education, so the number of years of education, um, marital status, and so on and so forth. But you can add many other functional forms here as well. For example, I can define wage as a function, let me call it F2 of uh, zip code. Um, zip code. Um, I, I just want to put uh, color of your car, etc. So zip code may affect your wage. Actually, you might be from more affluent families, so that 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 may affect your wage. But usually, car the color of your car doesn't affect your wage. So. So a good f, a good functional form, is the one that has the components that are understandable and interpretable. So we should refrain from putting irrelevant, um, irrelevant variables to define a response like weight. Your zip code perhaps is important, but color of your car or your weight perhaps doesn't affect your weight at all. So another good criterion for f is to have only relevant data there. Um, so, uh, it, depending on the functional form you choose, for example, if you use a linear functional form, you may be able to understand how each component affected. For example, if you have a linear functional form, you will be able to say how one year of, uh, how having an extra year of education on average will affect your income, or how, um, how married people differ in their income, and so on and so forth. So, depending on the functional form you choose for F, you might be able to answer some of the important questions that are um, that measured in the interpretability of the functional form uh, case. So, a good functional form, to review, is the one that predicts new points, is the one that doesn't have uh, variables that have nothing to do with your data, and is the and is and if you have choice between two functions that have same predictable, you always choose the one that is more interpretable. That means you can understand the effect of each independent variable or each um, factor or each um, yeah, a lot of names for it, each input with our uh, output or response, which was based here. So, so let's focus on what is the ideal 
uh, type uh, what is the ideal fx what is the ideal functional form that defines our y so what is this ideal fx as we mentioned earlier f can be can choose can have a lot of different functional forms which one is the best what is the ideal one so let's define ideal so what is ideal ideal in statistic in this case is the one that can say on average uh, what is the outcome so the uh, the for example in our wage example an ideal function is the one that can predict on average um, number of years of education on average number of years of education equal to four results on what wage so that's the ideal function if it predicts it correctly for for the average of people who are studying for uh, have a study for have four years of education this f will be ideal so if you have a lot of data so for it so let's call this x number of education number of years of education and let's call this one salary or balance in your account balance in balance in thousands thousand dollars the ideal functional form is the one that can predict on each of these years of education how much balance I have in my account for example how much balance of, uh, how much money do I have in my account for two years of education on average how much balance do I have in my account for four years of education on average and so on and so forth so that's the ideal F so if you have observations for every single years of education and anything in between then um, it's easy to find this average for example in this case we have a very busy data set we have a very rich data set for four years of education we have a point here we have millions of points here we have thousands of points here so so to predict what is the outcome of four years of education it's just simple to see what was the four years of how much how much people who had four years of education um, earned here so for example here they have minus 1.5 K in their uh, bank account here they have minus 1 K here they have let's say 1.5 K so the average of all these values would be the response you're looking at and that is this dot for four years of education the average of all the values you observe here would be your outcome and and this is a fancy way to say that say okay what I expect at four years of education is the expected value of your Y which was your account balance up for four years of education so that's that's a fancy way to say on average how much do you expect a person with four years of education having their uh, in his account balance so that's the ideal F we are looking after. So if you have a very rich data set, you can do the same um, calculation for every single point. For example, at three years old, sorry, at three years of education, you find this to be an average. At 3.1 years of education, you find this to be an average balance, and so on and so forth. So if you connect these dots, you will get this curve here. That, that's, a, that's a very um, great functional form because at each, um, at each point for education it it gives you how much on average you expect for account balance um, throughout this example I used wage and account balance interchangeably um, I think I can, account balance is more sensible response because you have negative account balance here wage cannot be negative unless you do some voluntary works that you're not paid for so the best functional form in theory is the one that can predict the average outcome at each point, the average outcome of your response at each point in input correctly. So if you have a very rich data set, this is attainable. You can find such a functional form. But as we will see later on, this is not always the case. You may have a sparse data set where you, you do not have observation for some of your values for example let's focus on 
Um, one example here. So let's say for the same data set, this was our response variable. We just had a couple of observations. Say this was our number of years of education. This was our account balance. So let's say this is four years of education. We don't have any observation here to take an average of all the outcomes. So for these types of uh, problem, which is always the case, usually you do not have uh, a full set of observations. You, you have sparse data sets. Um, you cannot use simple averaging technique to find the outcomes for each point and then take the uh, curve like this. So we, we have to come up with better ideas. So let me get back to, the, uh, to our main topic. Um, to generalize our discussion, a, fun a good functional form on any vector uh, in previous example, we only had one um, independent variable or one input. Now we have three inputs. So a good function is the one that gives you the expected value of your account balance or sales. Let me define it as sales or account balance, any response based on all the values of your response, uh, of your input variables. For example, how much sales I'm expecting on average, and the cities that spend, let's say, $1,000 on TV ads, $150 on radio ads, and let's say $15 on newspaper ads. So that's the ideal functional form we are looking after in this case. Um, so it's not always uh, possible to predict every single one. It's not always um, easy to find cities that have this much sale in it and then take an average of it. Ideally, we want to have, if, let's say you had 100 cities that each one of them has spent $1,000 on TV, $150 on radio, and $15 on newspaper, then you would look at the sales of each one of these cities and take an average of that. That would be your outcome. That, that's the ideal one. But, but usually you do not have such a privilege or such a, such a rich data set. That is why uh, you have to come up with another idea, and 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 the way um, statistic, statisticians have dealt with it said, okay, we do not have the exact function. We do not have a rich data set to come come up with um, the best functional form. But what we have another privilege, and that is, let's say these are my data points. This is a sparse data point, and you want to define a functional form called gx like this. gx has a distance from your observations. gx is your model, is, is, the, is the functional form you define. It has a vertical distance from your, um, from your observations. Ideally, ideally, you want to find um, um, so, so each one of these is called error term. Oh, oops. Each one of these, oh, I don't know why this happened. Okay. So this is, shit. Okay, shoot. Um, so this is called an error term. So this is epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, and so on and so forth. So we have error terms for the differences between, um, our observations and our regression line. So ideally, we want to minimize these epsilon. So we want to minimize epsilon i squared. In other terms, we want to minimize um, the expected value of our observations from our function given x's. And this shall be squared. That's a formalized version of um, describing what we have in expected value. And, um, and ideally, we want to find a g that, that minimizes this one. 
So that's a fancy way to say, okay, we want to minimize this, these distances. So the ideal or optimal predictor of y is a functional form that minimizes these differences of these distances. For simple linear regression, it's called the least square method. One thing to notice is a very important notion is called irreducible error. If we know the true functional form, that's our main assumption. Let's say you are God and you know the true functional form. Let's call it F. If you know true functional form, there are part of error that you cannot control for. And these are called irreducible error. These are the errors you should never ever try to capture. If you capture these errors, that means you are overfitting your data. So you should always refrain from capturing this type of error. And that is that exists because of many things. These are because because of the variation exists in your model. Um, it, it, it is there because there is something that we didn't control at all. And, uh, and, and one, one thing to remember is that you should never ever have a model that predicts this irredu irreducible model. If you have such a model, that means you're overfitting your data. That means you're overfitting your data. So, um, okay, sorry, I jumped too fast. So, if you just, if you try to minimize uh, your, if you, if you do not know fx and you want to estimate it with f hat x, you want to find a function that works with fx. We usually never ever know this fx. We never know what true functional form is. We try to estimate it with a function that we assume or set of functions we assume. And we again, we want to minimize this these errors. If you want to minimize these errors, please do not care too much about the math inside it. The only thing I want to convey here is that if you want to minimize that functional form, there is a part you can do better, and that's that that's the reducible part. That's because of misspecification of the functional form you chose. For example, if the le if the real uh, functional form that describes your variables is beta one x plus beta. 2x2 and you're trying to estimate it based on beta 0 plus beta 1x so let's call this fx that is the truth but you're trying to estimate it with f hat x you can never do anything about the irreducible part of error which was the error that exists all the time because of the fact you you do not have information of all the variables that affect it. But one thing you can always do is to reduce this reducible error by choosing a better function. For example, if you choose this functional form, you're away from reality. If you choose the correct functional form, your reducible error will converge to zero. So that's the part we can control. That's the part we should never ever control. You may have some questions. Say, okay, if we do not know the uh, true functional form, fx, how can we be sure we have decreased reducible error, not irreducible error? Because that is our total error. This is our total error. Total error has two parts, reducible and irreducible error. So you may ask, and that's a very valid question, how can we make sure that reducible error is decreased while irreducible hasn't been touched? And the answer to that is we always, we, we usually, um, divide our data sets into test and training data and from our test data we can we, we can always make sure we have a touch ir irreducible error so that that's that's one way to tackle it we later in the course we are going to learn cross validation is another way to make sure you didn't touch irreducible error so uh, so hold on to your question that will be answered thoroughly throughout the course so one point I want you to Remember is that we are, our goal is to use a functional form that is closest to reality or ideally we want to um, uh, we want to have zero, irre, zero reducible error. We want to take care of this part 
but we never want to touch irreducible there. So one of the questions that I asked earlier was um, this, this method of taking an average of all observations at one point and explain it as the response for that variable is a very powerful one for for the cases that you have very uh, busy data we have you have a very rich data set but what will happen if you have a data set like this that's a sparse data set for example here for that that's a subset of all observations we have let's call it number let's call um, x variable a num number of years of education and that, let's call it uh, account balance So here, for some observations like four, we do not have any response. So we do not have anyone with four years of education to know how much the average of that person, uh, how, how much the average account balance of that person was. Or for example, in this point, let's call it 2.75. At 2.75 years of education, that's a person who has but two years plus maybe two semesters of education, we don't have any person in our data set that represents this, these people. So how can we take an average of their account balance and report it? We cannot. One method that is being used is instead of just focusing on the people who are, uh, have exactly the same amount of education, we look at neighborhood of people and usually this neighborhood is chosen such that 10% of people will be qualified in this neighborhood and take an average of them. So, for instance, we look at the people who are earning between 3 point, uh, who have education between 3.75 years up to 4.25 years. We, we just look at this neighborhood and, for, and we, we record the uh, account balance of every single person in this neighborhood and take an average of that. The average of that, which is this point, um, sorry, it's not a straight line. Um, okay, that is better. Let's say it's two hundred dollars. It's point two. This is two hundred dollars. The ab that this two hundred dollars is the average of all people who were who had an education of three point seventy five to four point twenty five. And, and that's the response we have. We can do it here as well. So let's say you you want to have uh, you want to see. Uh, what, what is the average income of people who have 2.75 years of education? You take a neighborhood that has 10% of your data. Let's call this a neighborhood. That's that's a more sparse part of our data set. That's why our neighborhood is slightly larger. So in this neighborhood, we take the average of every single person who is in this neighborhood, and we get um, we get this much. Um, okay, not put a point. It's grabs it. Anyhow, we get this much. Okay. Um, we get this much as a response. So that will be negative thousand dollars. So you do it for every single point and then you connect these dots and what you get is this functional, uh, this functional, this green functional form. That is called the, the neighborhood search approach. I'm going to cover that uh, later. So one thing I want you to remember is the definition of this notation. So in the neighborhood search approach, you take an average of, what for, of, of the y's correspond to all x's in the neighborhood around the x. For example, this x was four years old of education, this x was 2.75 years of education. You take a neighborhood around it, that was the neighborhood around it. Look over all the people who are in this neighborhood, take an average of their income, that would be your response. That's, that's one way to deal with it. That's a very powerful way, by the way, but it lacks, it, it suffers a very important problem. And that is when you have more than four variables, when you have more than four, four variables, um, you cannot use this algorithm because your search, um, your search neighborhood will be so vast that uh, you exceed the whole, um, you exceed the uh, uh, whole space to get the 10% of people around you. So, so let's say you wanted to predict sales based on the 
amount of money you spend on ads on TV, radio, uh, let's say um, newspaper, um, let's say zip code, and also population of the neighborhood. So we have five variables. If you want to do that with the neighborhood method I described, you cannot do it. Um, later on in slide 8, I will show you why we cannot do such a thing. So um, to do that, we use more advanced techniques like kernel search and the spline smoothing methods that I'm going to um, cover in chapter 7 of the textbook. So when p is large, p is number of predictors. When p, number of predictors, is large, then we we have curse of dimensionality, and that is why we cannot use this neighborhood search algorithms. Because you always want to have 10% of your data around you whenever you choose a neighborhood. And to do that, you have to search for a vast amount of space. And the larger the space gets, the worse it becomes. So let's look at this slide. And this, this thoroughly explains what I tried to say. This is another example of a two-dimensional case. Um, so let's, let's look at the one dimension. Assume we only have x1. Assume we only have x1, we don't have these x2. In order to get 10% of data around x1, we only need this tiny neighborhood, this very tiny neighborhood. In this tiny neighborhood, we have 10% of our, all of our observations in whole space. If you have two variables, let's call, it, let's call this TV ads, and radio, if you have two observations. In order to get 10% of your data, you need a circle with this radius. This radius of circle will have 10% of data inside it. This radius of data will have 10% of data, and so on and so forth. As you can see, uh, what happened? Um, as you can see, this radius is so much larger than this small one because dimensional increase. If you are working on a three-dimensional case, the sphere we wanted to have would, would be even larger than, oops, the sphere you wanted to have would have uh, 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 okay, uh, the sphere you would like to have to incorporate 10% of your data would even be larger than this circle. So the more variables we choose, this is one variable case, this is two variable case, and so on and so forth. The more variables you get, the radius you would choose will be so large that it will almost um, have entire of your data set for that fraction of that. For example, if you want to get 10% of the fraction of your uh, observations, if you only have one variable, if you choose a radius that is, let's say, 0 0.05, which is 5% of your data set, it gives you 10% of your data. But if you have two variables, the radius you need um, will have a size of 0 0.15, 0. let's say 4. So you need to have you need to search 40%. So this radius is 40% of the whole space. You need to have 40% of your volume to uh, you need to search 40% of the volume to get 10% of data, and that becomes worse and worse for uh, f uh, when you have five or ten predictors. So these search algorithms only work when you have limited amount of uh, predictors p. So P comes with predictors. If you have more than four, you cannot use it. So another, so that these the the, the neighboring me mechanism, the, the, the neighborhood method, uh, doesn't use any functional form. It actually uses your data purely, and that is why it's called non-parametric approach. It doesn't have any parameter. So let's focus on more general versions of functional forms you can assume and the very first one is simple linear models these are simplest things you can use usually the best thing you can use and 
and by that you're imposing a functional form on your variables. So let me explain it in detail on the next uh, slide. So let, let me work with the simplest functional form you can assume. That's one variable linear function. So depending on how you choose beta 0 and beta 1, the functional forms you can get uh, functional forms you can get will get a linear case. So by, by setting beta 0 you're changing your intercept, by setting beta 1 you're setting your line. So among all possible lines um, you choose the one that best describes it. Another functional form you can choose on one variable case, which is still called linear, although it sounds nonlinear, is a cube uh, is quadratic function. And by choosing beta zero, beta one, and beta two, what you do is that you change your shapes from this to this, this, and you can also change its location. So there are certain classes of linear functions uh, uh, functions that you can tune by just tuning beta 0, beta 1, beta 2. For example, when, whenever you have this case, you can never ever have a functional form that has this shape. So you can never have this color shape. So this class doesn't allow us to get this shape. And another thing I want to mention is that if you set beta 2 to 0, in this case, if you set beta to 0, um, you, you end up with a linear case. So, linear case is a special case of uh, quadratic case where beta 2 is equal to 0. We can also have more general forms of um, functional forms, and that is when you have more than one variable. For example, a linear function that that is de that defines beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus x 1 plus beta 2 x 2 remember before we I had 1 x and the same thing to the power of 2 now we I have two different x's let's say this is TB at this radio expenditure by tuning beta 0 beta 1 and beta 2 what you can do is def defining different planes because that's a three-dimensional case. Let's call this sales. This is TV. Now let's call this radio. So what you're trying to do is to define these observations by a plane. And the, the way this plane is defined is by tuning beta 0, beta 1, and beta 2. So let's get back to linear functions. So so whenever you have p variable, variable, <laughs> variables, whenever you have p variables, you need to estimate p plus one parameters because you always have an intercept. So our goal is to find the one that that, that gives us the best hyperplane. Although the linear function is almost never cor correct, it's almost never correct, it does a very good job in most of our application. It's, it's extremely well in interpretation, so you can use it for many applications. But at the same time, um, it's not too bad a fit most of the time. Unless you have very nonlinear shapes, um, you can almost do as good in linear models as a more sophisticated one. Um, one thing I always suggest is simpler the better. The simpler the better. So if you can use a simpler model and you get predictability as much as uh, the predictabilities you get um, in simple application, in, in more sophisticated versions of uh, functional forms, always stick to the simpler one. That's the rule. That's number one rule. Always stick to the simplest model you can get. Do not overcomplicate a thing. Do not overcomplicate things. Okay. So how do we find how do we tune beta zero and beta one in this functional form? Is again 
vr least the square you try to minimize the distances between your points and the lines and the line that minimizes this expected value is the one that fits better and as i said earlier this is also a linear function because the only thing that matters is that you le it should be linearized on the coefficients variables are not that important for example i can i can i can define x2 as x to the two power of 2 and x1 as x then i can rewrite the same function as f1 of x1 and x2 equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 that will be purely linear. Again, to find the best nonlinear function in quadratic form that describes these variables, again, you, you minimize um, the distances between your observations and, and the different functional sets that you can get, and that will be your best option. Again, I want to rem remind you for quadratic forms, you cannot capture this shape you're limited to certain types of shapes. If you want to capture this type, shape, you have to go to the quadratic functional form. Sorry, uh, cubic functional forms, which looks like this. Okay, wonderful. So, so now let's work on um, some some examples based on simulated data assume income which is our response variable is a function of years of education and seniority how many years you have been in the industry and this is the true functional form we have this surface is the true functional form we have so there is a known functional form on education and seniority that describes this my guess is that this functional form has this form um, beta 1 education plus beta 2 seniority plus beta 3 education times seniority. That's my guess. I might be wrong, but I think this functional form, true functional form, looks like this. And we always have irreducible error, and that, that is the distances between our true functional form and our observations. So our best function is this blue fun the blue surface that is the true functional form now now um, now let's try to estimate uh, um, to estimate a, a plane that describes it and that will be our plane so so let's say we do not know what f is so we, we are not God now so we want to estimate uh, we, we want to find a surface that is on education and seniority only in linear term. That means it doesn't have the extra term that I guess it had, uh, which was the product of these two. So that will be the best plane we can find that describes this data. So that was the true functional form. This is the true functional form, and that's the best plane that we can get. It's very close to reality, very, very close to reality, but not exactly the same. Um, and now let's look at another functional form which is called um, spline. I will thoroughly cover that in Chapter 7 of the textbook. And let's call it uh, spline. That's, that's a lower, uh, I think that is a thin plate spline. Yes, it's thin plate spline. And it looks more or less the same as our true functional form. So that was our true functional form. This is the function we get from a spline. That is very close. It's a thin plate of spline. And now let's look at another functional form that is a very, that's a higher order of um, spline and that passed through all the points. So we, we tuned our function such that it passed through all the points. So my question is, is it a good model? Is it a good model? And why? Why isn't it? If not, why isn't it? The answer is no, absolutely no. That You should throw that model in garbage. Why? Because it has overfitted. It is overfitted. Why? Because it passed all the points. And remember, in our true function had some irreducible error. 
Here you had a functional form that crossed all the irreducible error. So ideally we like this spline because it's very close to this one. So this is a good proxy. Maybe it's slightly overfitted as well, but it's a good proxy or linear function is a good proxy. But this highly nonlinear spline that we used is absolutely garbage. We should throw it away because it tried to capture irreducible error as well by passing through all the points. And that's a very bad thing to happen. So I, I stopped the course here with this part of the lecture. I'm going back to continue the lecture on uh, the next video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, see you in a bit.